Hello and welcome to Nuhal's Retro Lab. Today we're going to be taking this classic ZX Spectrum and we're going to be enhancing it to output composite video. This should be a big improvement over the RF video out that it comes with by default. The actual operation should be pretty quick, but we're first going to open it up and look in detail at how images are generated inside of the computer. So let's open it up and get started. The Spectrum generates the video signal initially at the ULA. It creates three signals, Y, U, and V. These are not just random signals or custom signals to the Spectrum. They're actually the Y, U, V color space that you might have heard of, and it's very used in video transmissions. The Y signal is the luminance of the image, so you can roughly think about it as the brightness of the image that is being displayed. The U signal is the blue color of the image minus the Y signal that we just saw a second ago. And the V signal is the red color of the image minus the Y signal. Before going any further, let's actually look at those signals working on the spectrum. So to test that, I wrote a very quick basic program, I'll put a link at the bottom so you can download it if you want to, to just simply change the colors of the screen to some specific cases that then we're going to measure. So in order to do this, we're going to need the spectrum, we're going to need a way to load the program, and obviously we need a way to interact with the spectrum, so I'm hooking up the keyboard. Let's fire it up and do some measurements. Let's start looking at the Y signal coming out of the ULA. That's been 17. Yeah, that's exactly what we expect to see. Right now I'm running a completely black screen, so there should be no luminance whatsoever. So the only thing we're seeing is the sync pulses. Yeah, this is a perfect illustration because he shows that they're spaced out at 64 microseconds. Let's pause for a second and let's see if we can make sense of that 64 microseconds. We know the PAL system shows 50 frames per second, and we know they are 625 lines per screen. If we do the math, we would end up with 32 microseconds. But in the PAL system, we actually show every other line every other frame. So really, we're only showing half as many lines every 1 50th of a second. So now we go back and take 50 screens per second divided by half of 625 lines, we end up exactly with 64 microseconds, which is good because it's exactly what we're seeing in the oscilloscope. And then you're probably seeing some pulsing, some changing in there. So I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to capture a single sequence. So what you see there is the beginning of a new frame. There's a period in which we're not sending lines and that's why we every so often we see a little, a little glitch in there, a little change. And now let's change the screen to be a white screen. And here it's worth zooming in a little bit more and capturing a single sequence. Okay. So this is a white screen capture. And it's not just purely white screen. If you see, there's the right half, I use the bright attribute. So the right half is brighter than the left half. And then the border is also just the darker white. That's why we're seeing this drop to white and then even further to the brightest white, it can um, render then back to the other one for the border and back to the normal horizontal sync pulse. The brighter it is, the in this case, the lower the voltage is going to be. If we capture several of them and we zoom out, we'll see a similar interesting pattern to what we saw before. And that's this. Here we have the beginning of the frame and here we don't see any brighter white. And that's because we're displaying the border on the top, then we're displaying a mix of, you know, on the left, regular you know, gray and then white, and then there's the border below and there's the beginning of the new frame. So this confirms exactly our intuition of how this uh, Y signal is supposed to behave. So now let's look at U. So U is 15 and let's look at it for a black screen. And we see something pretty similar to the Y signal. We see those horizontal pulses also spread out every 64 microseconds. Actually, I didn't see this anywhere in the specification when I looked at it quickly, 
but obviously there's some marking of the uh, horizontal sync in here as well. The information it carries is blue, the blue on the screen, minus Y, which is the luminance of the screen. Since everything is black, then it just doesn't have really any information. So it looks like the default is 2 volts. It means there's just nothing there. If we switch to the white screen, we pretty much don't see much of a change. I mean, there's a couple of little tiny glitches there. I don't think they convey any information. The screen being white or gray, blue minus the luminance is pretty much the same thing. So there's nothing there. Now let's look at the screen with alternating black and blue bars. And there we go. Let's, let's capture a single sequence. We see exactly the two bars of blue right there, the, those dips. So this is the border, black border, blue bar, black bar, blue bar, and then border again. Now it's interesting that I also drew what the rightmost blue bar. I used the bright attribute, but you don't see anything in here. And that's because it's not any bluer, it's just that it's brighter. So the luminance, it's going to show a similar pattern as we saw with the you know, regular white or the gray and the bright white. So let's confirm that. Let's, let's run this and let's go to luminance in here. And let's do a single capture. Okay. It's clearly not nearly as bright as the white was. This is what it's showing us. It's not dipping nearly as far below. But the right one looks like it's a little, a little lower than the left ball. So that means it's a little brighter. So again, confirming exactly what we expect. Okay, let's go back to the U signal and display a black screen with red bars instead of blue bars. What we get is a little similar to how it was before, but now the pulses are going upwards or more positive. That's because, remember, the U signal is the blue content of the screen minus the Y signal, the luminance of the signal. We have no blue, so that's a zero, but red contributes some to the luminance, so it, it adds brightness over red. So we're subtracting that, and the signal is reversed, so we're subtracting a number from zero. So it's those two little more positive bumps that we see there that represent the red bars in the U signal. If we look at this on the V signal, which V is the red component minus the luminance, we should see something very similar to what we saw with the blue bars. And it's kind of similar, but there's something very obviously different about it. So we see the two pulses representing the two bars, but every other line is flipped with respect to the previous one. Now that's something that I wasn't expecting until I looked at it. I don't know exactly why they did this. I suspect it has something to do with saving some logic when they're going to combine the color signals later on. And especially because in the PAL system, the color information gets sent negated every other frame. So maybe this is starting to set that up. I'm not sure. But it's interesting to see that and confirm that in the oscilloscope. Let's look at one last case. Let's turn the screen black with green bars this time. We're in the V signal. What should it look like? At first sight, it looks very similar to the V signal when we were displaying red bars, but that doesn't make sense. V is red minus Y, so why would that one look the same as this one? So actually, they're not the same, but the fact that they're every other frame is reversed makes it a little harder to see the pattern. But this one is exactly the opposite of the red bars. In the case of the red bars, we had a lot of red and some luminance, and so those were positive voltages. In this case, we have zero red and a lot of luminance. So these are negative voltages. The only way you can tell is by realizing that the pulses with the red bars were always pointing the same direction as the horizontal sink, Whereas here, the pulses are in the opposite direction of the horizontal sync pulse. So we have our Y, U, and V signals, but those signals are not what's used to display images on the spectrum. Instead, they are transformed into something else. 
The U and V signals, which carry the color information, are combined in the LM1889N integrated circuit into a single signal that carries all the color information. And then Y, the signal that carries the luminance information, is combined with that new color signal on the transistor TR1. And then finally, the resultant signal is buffered through TR2. So let's now have a look at the video signal that is created after U, V, and Y are combined. This is pretty similar to what we saw before. This indicates the horizontal sync, so it's a pulse for every line. And then it contains some information in which it's included the how bright things are on the screen. In this particular case, we're displaying a black screen, so that's kind of what we would expect. If we move to a white screen, specifically white and then like the brighter part, then we end up something pretty similar to what we saw in the white signal. So we have the pulse, we have the darker white and then the bright white, and again followed by the darker white and the pulse again. We can zoom in a little bit more. And there's here, there's some additional interesting information. So apart from the sync pulses, and we have this little bunch of data there. Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit more. That in there is called the color burst. The key thing is that with this color burst, tells the interpreting machine that this signal contains color information. So what if we go now to the screen that is black with blue lines? So we ended up something like that. We see the sinks, we see the color burst, and then this is the same as the black screen that we saw earlier, and this is the blue, the two blue lines. What you see there is the encoded high frequency sine wave that based on the phase of that sine wave is indicating this is a blue color. You can't really see it in the oscilloscope. So this then, this combined signal, video signal, is the composite PAL signal. That's exactly what it is. And that's why I'm catching it at the input to the RF modulator. So if we want the ZX spectrum to output composite signal, this is where we need to catch it and output it from there. Okay, that should cover everything we need to know about image generation in the ZX spectrum. Now it's time to actually add the composite video out. So we have multiple options on how to get the composite video out of this computer. One of the ways is to add another RC jack next to the RF out. For that, we need to make a small hole in here. I'm just not a big fan of punching holes in you know, classic computers. So a better option for me is to reuse the RF out jack. Once we add composite out, you'll never want to use RF out, or at least that has been my experience. So we can easily reuse this RC jack in such a way that it outputs the composite out. And if one day we really wanted to revert it back to outputting RF out, it's something it can be easily done. So let's try that approach. Here's the RF modulator of this board and this is the lead that we measured earlier that contains the composite video signal. This other one over here, it carries about five volts, and then the modulator itself is connected to ground through the structure itself. So what we need to do to um, output composite video is to remove the five volt signal because we're not gonna be needing that, and unhook this, and pretty much connect the composite video signal directly to the jack itself. Now, we're not actually going to connect it directly. We're going to put a capacitor in the middle just to decouple the TV from the electronics inside the spectrum. It won't matter in most of the cases, but it's an extra safety precaution that it's a, it's a good idea to do it. Instead of just cutting the leads, I'm going to desolder them. That way it's easy to put back together at some point if uh, we decide that we do want an RF out. So there you go, that's one. And there's the other. I'm gonna open it up. And we're just gonna fold the leads back inside. Once we open the RF modulator, we want to desolder this resistance that is touching the RF out, and that will basically disconnect the RC jack from all of the electronics in here. 
and we're going to bypass all of this and just connect the composite video signal directly to the jack. So we're going to use a 100 microfarad capacitor and um, 25 volts, and we're going to hook it up in such a way that the negative lead, so the short one, is touching the RC jack, and the positive lead is connected to the composite video signal. It's a little tricky getting the leads touching the right places. You need to bend it in funny ways. So let's see if we can do this. There we go. So you can pass it through. The RC jack has a hole in there, so you can pass it through. It's pretty convenient. And then this one we can bend. I'll just bend it like this for now. So we can bend it like that. And like that. And then we'll just solder it in place and cut the extra leads. And there we go. That looks good. Let's put the light back together and test it out. So there's one last detail that I like to do when I mod computers this way, which is we have our composite video coming out of here, but you have no way of knowing it just by looking at it. So it's actually not uncommon for somebody to hook this up to an RF cable and be like, what's going on? This is not working. So I like to indicate some way that this is a composite video out now. Um, for that, I just print a small label like that and glue it in place. Just like that. So now it's immediately obvious that this has been modified and this is a composite video. Okay, let's try it. I need to hook up the composite cable. That. And let's turn it on and find out. There you go. Perfect. So how much difference is there really between the composite video out that we just made and the RF video out that it came with? There's only one way to answer that question, which is let's take some pictures and compare the two. Initially, I took some footage, both of RF and composite video, and surprisingly, it's really hard to tell the difference in a video, and especially once you add the YouTube compression. So instead of using a video, I decided to take some pictures, and this shows an example. On the left, you have the RF video, and on the right is the composite video. And yeah, the composite is way better. Here's another example. This is from a game. And again, on the left is the RF and on the right is composite. These screenshots leave it very clear. The jump in image quality is huge. Okay, so composite video out is way better than the RF video out that it came with. But how good is composite video out really? Is it comparable to the RGB out of later spectrum models? Let's find out. And the answer is, they're surprisingly similar. They both look really, really good on a TV. If you look at the screenshots closely, you'll see that the composite out maybe has a few edges that are not present there in the RGB. The image quality of both is really good. So really the composite video out is a huge improvement over RF. It's almost as good as full RGB out. So there we go. We have a better than new ZX Spectrum with the spiffy composite video out. It definitely took us longer to get here learning about the image generation than to actually perform the mod itself. But I think it was worthwhile because now we know a lot more about what's going on inside and why we're doing what we're doing. So I hope you find the video useful. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then.